The mid-16th century saw the rise of Protestantism in England, initiated by King Henry VIII, break from Rome, and nurtured by Edward VI and the nine-day queen, Lady Jane Grey. This was brought to a halt during the reign of Mary Tudor, who reinstated Catholicism in England and earned the title Bloody Queen Mary for her role in the murder of over 260 Protestants. Things changed when Elizabeth I came to the throne. She reinstated Protestantism and cemented earlier reforms that had started and established the Anglican Church. Catholics, though, viewed her as an illegitimate queen because they never recognized King Henry VIII's divorce from Catherine of Aragon, thus making his marriage to Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth's mother, illegitimate, thus making her an illegitimate queen in their eyes. Rome then wanted to establish a Catholic monarchy and attempted to do this through a military invasion. On the 28th of May, 1588, the Spanish Armada, a fleet of 130 ships, set sail from Spain to England. One of the largest fleets ever assembled at a huge cost to Spain. It had almost double the firepower of the entire English Navy, almost guaranteeing an easy victory. They were first sighted on July the 19th in Lizard, Cornwall, and the news was relayed to London via a system of beacons. Sailing up the English Channel, they missed an opportunity to attack the English fleet, stuck in the tidal mud in Plymouth. Hoping to reach the Netherlands to pick up 30,000 soldiers to battle with the English, they dropped anchor in Calais. On the 29th of July, across from the cliffs of Dover, over in the French waters of Calais behind me, the Armada was attacked by eight English fire ships that came in, broke their formation, allowing the smaller and more agile English ships to come in and wreak havoc. The Armada broke up and sailed up the channel to the North Sea while being pursued by the English ships. They continued around Scotland, but much of the fleet crashed onto the rocks of Scotland and Ireland, as in their hasty retreat that many of them had lost their anchors. Of the 130 ships that originally set sail, only 67 of them made it back home. Unaware of the Armada's fate, the English militias assembled in Tilbury, Essex, where Elizabeth was invited to inspect the troops. Wearing a silver breastplate over a white velvet dress, she gave a famous speech. My loving people, we have been persuaded by some that are careful for our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. But I assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. I know I have the body but of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too, and think, foul scorn, that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe would dare to invade the borders of my realm. When it was clear that the Armada's attempt to overthrow Protestantism had failed, England was relieved and Elizabeth I led a thanksgiving service to St. Paul's Cathedral that was attended by almost as many as her coronation. Many took the defeat of the Armada to be a sign of God's favour and the inviolability of the rule of the Queen and her realm. Protestantism was uplifted and medals were inscribed that bore variations of the inscription, God blew the winds and they were scattered, or he blew and they were scattered. While historians debate exactly what was the factor that led to the defeat of the Armada, one thing is clear, providence played a key role. Now in our lives today, it may not be on such a grand scale as the Armada back then, but God still moves through providential circumstances. He doesn't always speak audibly, 
He doesn't always have a bloodless hand writing on the wall, as in Daniel chapter 5. But God still rules in the affairs of men. And in our lives today, He still moves through providential circumstances. May we be open to His leading in this manner. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. I see no reason why Guy Fawkes should ever be forgot. A short rhyme that I, along with numerous other children growing up in England, learned in school, and yet today it seems that many have forgotten the story. In the early 1600s, England was under a Protestant king, King James. Born in Edinburgh Castle, he ascended to the Scottish throne and when the Scottish and English thrones merged in 1603, he became the King of England as well. King James is best known for the translation of the Bible that is named after him, translated over a period of five years and released in 1611. It is a masterpiece of the English language, shaping many of the terms and phrases that we use today. Had the gunpowder plot in 1605 been successful, it is likely that the work of translation would have stopped. The Crown of England had gone back and forth between Catholic and Protestant hands in the early to mid 16th century, but during the reign of Elizabeth I, some stability had been brought to the throne. Despite this, it was the dream of Catholics, both at home and abroad, to restore a Catholic monarch to the throne. An audacious plot was launched to assassinate the king, not by a bullet or by poison, but by blowing up the Houses of Parliament during the state's opening of Parliament. Thus, not only killing the king, but also many of his close advisers and members of Parliament. It was then the hope of the Catholics to bring a new monarch and government to England. In those days, security was not what it is today and they were able to rent a space underneath Parliament which they filled with 36 barrels of gunpowder. This huge supply of explosives could not be detonated remotely and someone had to light it manually and that job fell to Guy Fawkes. Fawkes, born in York, had worked for several years in the Spanish army as an explosives expert and whilst he was not a major player in this plot, Due to the role that he played, his name is etched in history and he is the one best remembered. Up to this point, everything had been kept top secret, but there was to be a fortunate leak. Just prior to the 5th of November, an anonymous letter was sent to William Parker, warning him not to attend Parliament on that day. Suspicion was aroused and a thorough search of the building took place whereby they found Guy Fawkes and his stash of gunpowder. He was taken to the Tower of London and tortured until he gave up the names of his fellow conspirators. The coherence of his signature before and after his torture reveals the severity of his punishment. Eventually they captured and executed all those involved in the plot, including the ringleader, Robert Catesby. The King and Parliament had been saved. England had been spared under the bloody takeover and Protestantism remained the dominant religion. Today, this event is commemorated in every village, town and city across the country with bonfires being lit. And an event often fondly known as Bonfire Night. In a country that has remained independent for hundreds of years, this is perhaps the closest thing to a national or Independence Day celebration. Something that stands out from this episode of history is how thin and fragile the line is between freedom and tyranny. 
A famous person once said that your freedom and mine cannot be separated. And yet today we live in a society where if someone's rights are being abused, people are more likely to film it on their mobile phones than they are to stop and do something to help. May we defend our freedoms, civil and religious, any time they come under attack, and the freedoms of others if we ever see them under threat as well. In 1620, a boat laden with 130 passengers set sail for the New World, a frontier that had been breached by only a few other Europeans and would eventually come to be known as the United States of America. They would land on the East Coast in Cape Cod before finally settling in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Their journey, however, begins in a small English village. Scrooby lies in Nottinghamshire, and whilst it appears calm and humble, the residents who came from this village over 380 years ago were firm in belief and strong in conviction. The principal members of the Scrooby separatists were Clifton as pastor, Robinson as teacher, and Brewster as ruling elder. 30 residents left Scrooby and headed for the Netherlands where they joined John Smith, who had previously left England with another group of separatists, though this would not be their permanent home. Further meetings would take place and those in Holland decided that they would head to the Americas. On the English side of the channel, there were people who were unhappy with the religious restrictions being imposed by the church and they also decided that England was ceasing to be a habitable place. The Mayflower set sail from this exact spot here on the Thames in Rotherhite, South London. Above me, the Mayflower pub marks this spot where 53 people set sail for America. Its sister ship, the Speedwell, left from the Netherlands, but when it was 200 miles off the coast of Cornwall, it had to turn back because it had developed a leak. Those on board the Speedwell then disembarked and got on board the Mayflower, swelling its numbers from 53 to 130. 43 of those people on the Mayflower were separatists, Puritans who did not believe in the union of church and state and were unhappy at how the Anglican church was treating those who disagreed with her. Those on board had to put up with cramped living conditions, food shortages, little fresh meat, little water, severe seasickness and violent storms making it an incredibly arduous journey. They finally sighted land on the 9th of November 1620 in Cape Cod and would eventually anchor in Provincetown on the 21st of November. Of those who made the journey, over half would die that first winter due to the harsh weather, illness and the poor diet available to them. Little did these people realize the impact that this journey would have on history and the legacy that they would leave, that in just 150 years, the land that they arrived in would fight and win its independence, and just 200 years past its independence would rank as the most powerful nation in the world. For those on board the ship, I'm sure their actions did not seem so heroic and brave, but history remembers them well. Never underestimate the impact that your life can have on future successive generations. The decisions that you make, 
the sacrifices you endure and the principles that you live by can have a profound impact on your children and it can have a profound impact on the successive generations of young people that come after you. Our life that we live, however small they may seem, can have an impact that will be reflected only in eternity. What was at the heart of the Reformation? Was it a location? Was it Augsburg, Geneva, Wittenberg, or Edinburgh? Or was it something more than that? The focal point was that the Bible was written for and could be interpreted and understood by the common man. The result of this focus was a discovery of who the Antichrist was and who Jesus Christ was and that he was freely accessible to all. On October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg Castle Cathedral, oblivious of the ramifications of his actions. Luther was 34 and throughout the rest of his life, he would be the engine that drove the Reformation, inspiring countless generations to come. At the time, Luther was responding to John Tetzel, who was traveling through Germany selling indulgences, essentially a fast ticket to heaven, in order to fund the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Based on Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, Luther believed in salvation through faith by grace, while the papacy believed that salvation required some action on our behalf, which in this case was the purchasing of indulgences. In 1999, the Catholic Church signed a joint declaration with the Lutheran Church, which was hailed by many as a step in bridging the divide and reaching a consensus on justification. However, the Catholic Church still affirmed the view of the Council of Trent on justification, which declared upholding justification by faith alone as anathema. The Roman Catholic Church's basic view of salvation is still dependent on the mediation of the Church, the distribution of grace by means of the sacraments, the intercession of the saints, and purgatory even after the Joint Declaration of 1999. Jesus prayed in John 17 that his people may be one as he and the Father are one. In the Bible at the end of time, it says there will be one flock and one shepherd. However, truth must never be sacrificed for unity and peace cannot be attained through compromise. Today, unity is often secured through shallow statements and a minimization of historical events and a reinterpretation of those same events to suit current agendas. Martin Luther was not a saint, nor were his beliefs completely without error, but his understanding and conviction that the Bible could be understood by the common man and that salvation was available through direct communion between the believer and Jesus Christ still stands today. The issues that gave birth to the Reformation 500 years ago are still relevant to the church at large today. While we should welcome all opportunities for clarification and cooperation, we should also affirm, as did the Reformers, that the Bible is our final authority and that salvation is through faith alone. Luther famously said, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen.
today it will be well for the church at large and each one of us individually to take this as our guide. It is neither right nor safe to go against conscience and scripture accompanied by sound reason and the Holy Spirit needs to be our teacher. Let us be faithful to God's word, gracious in how we share it, firm in our understanding of its truths and immovable in our convictions. The Waldensians stand as one of the most faithful groups of people throughout history in Europe, faithful to the Word of God and faithful amidst much trial. Despite suffering repeated persecution over the course of almost a millennia, in the 17th century they would go through one of the worst episodes of their history. In January of 1655, the Duke of Savoy gave the Waldensians in the lower valleys a choice, either attend mass or leave the valleys. Rather than compromise, some 2,000 believers journeyed across snowy rivers and hills in the dead of winter to be welcomed by their fellow believers in the upper valleys. But this was merely the calm before the storm. In April of that year, the Duke sent an army into the valleys, and on April the 24th, at 4 a.m. a Saturday, the massacre started. Not content with simply killing them, the soldiers and monks who accompanied them invented barbaric tortures. Babies and children had their limbs torn from their bodies by sheer strength. Parents were forced to watch their children tortured and killed before they themselves were tortured and killed. Fathers were made to wear the decapitated heads of their children as they were marched to their death. Some Christians were literally plowed into their own field. Some were flayed or burned alive, and many endured much worse. Unburied bodies, dead and alive, covered the ground. In order to escape this terrible massacre, hundreds of Waldensians fled to a large cave in the towering Mount Castelluzzo. The murderous soldiers, however, found them and marched them to the top. They came to this spot right here and were hurled over the edge to their death on the rocks below. I believe that on the resurrection morning, many faithful believers will rise to glory from the bottom of this mountain and in this valley. This is the reference in Milton's famous sonnet to the bloody Piedmontese that hurled mother and infant down the rocks. Survivors of the massacre were few, but they rallied together and wrote to Christians throughout Europe for help. Their letters included the heart-rending words, our tears are no longer of water, they are of blood. They do not merely obscure our sight, but choke our very heart. When Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of England, heard of the massacre, he called for a national day of fasting and collected money to send to meet the physical needs of the Waldensians. This was not the only instance of persecution and it continued over three and a half decades from 1655 to 1689. During that time, more than half were driven from the valleys. Yet in 1689, Henry Arnaud from Noyon, Switzerland led a force of 800 warriors back to the border. In the winter, they resisted four separate attacks from a much larger army. In spring, the papal armies returned with 22,000 soldiers, this time to fight a much smaller Waldensian force of just 400 men. Yet they were once again defeated, and not only that, not one of the 400 men was lost in this battle. 
they'd return to the valleys in what was called the Glorious Return, reclaiming them once again as a place where they could live and worship. The Waldensians had a faith that reminds me of Job. They were a people who suffered attacks and persecutions for several centuries, close to a thousand years, suffering immeasurably. For many, it did not weaken their faith, but rather strengthen it. Sometimes in life, we may be serving God, dedicating our lives to Him, and we still go through hard times, trials, and suffering that many say we do not deserve. May we have a faith like Job, who said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Whatever we go through in life, may we stay hold of God, trusting that he has our best interests at heart.